Welcome to Security Scorecard Certification Training. I'm your host, Sam Kasumi, Chief Operating Officer and Co-Founder of Security Scorecard. Today, I'm going to walk you through the state of third-party risk management and the current market challenges. We're also going to talk about the exciting and unique value proposition that Security Scorecard Solution provides to the market. So let's get started. Security Scorecard was founded in 2013 by two former Chief Information Security Officers, Dr. Alexander Yampolsky and myself, Sam Kasumi. Both founders have deep security and technology expertise and have subsequently experienced the challenges and frustrations of vendor risk management throughout their entire career. Both founders are very passionate about solving this problem for others, and this passion for information security and for problem solving runs throughout the culture and the DNA of the entire company. Security Scorecard has experienced explosive growth in both headcount and revenue. This growth has attracted the support of top-tier venture capitalist firms, such as Sequoia Capital, who led Security Scorecard's 2015 Series A round of financing, and Google Ventures, who led the most recent Series B financing in 2016. The company has over 100 employees, including subject matter experts in information security, threat intelligence, white hat hacking, malware reverse engineering, and also data science analytics. The company has seen over 200% revenue growth and customer base increase in 2016 alone. The vision of the company is to instantly and non-intrusively measure the overall security risk of any company in the world. Let's more closely examine the words that comprise the vision. Instantly means no waiting, no waiting for paperwork, no waiting for scans or assessments or audits to complete. The information is available always and on demand. Non-intrusively means the methods that Security Scorecard uses to collect and attribute threat intelligence data are hands-off and require no prior permission from the company. Measuring the overall risk means that the information is continuously collected and monitored, and new information is always provided into these companies' scorecards. Any company in the world, the data that's being collected covers any company. That means, as a user, you simply need to enter the name or URL of any company, and a scorecard is produced on demand. Today we're going to talk first about the magnitude of a third-party risk management. Why is this such a big problem and why has it been so hard to solve? What are the limitations of current management methods? Why do current methods fall short? We'll also talk about the Security Scorecard platform. We'll give an overview of how it works, the value it provides, and customer benefits. Then we'll talk about closing deals with Security Scorecard. Third-party uh, vendor or partner risk management is not a new concept. It's been around for well over 30 years. But in more recent years, we've seen it percolate to the top of the list of concerns for chief information security officers, chief risk officers, and even boards of directors are now thinking more about third-party risk management. Why is that the case? What's changed? In the next few slides, we're going to talk about the paradigm shift that we've observed take place over the last 10 years and talk about how that changed the way that companies are thinking about vendor risk management. If we think back to technology strategies 5, 10, 20 years ago and beyond, companies operated using what we call the Fortress model. The Fortress model means that all technology and all operations are housed within the four walls of the organization. Organizations had high levels of trust when it came to security because the security was being managed by internal employees. Um, and the internal employees, these are technology architects, system administrators, they built and controlled the blueprint, uh, the technology blueprint for the organization. So you can 
sort of think back and imagine um, organizations, uh, offices having their data center in their basement, right? Uh, the entire data center was uh, usually floor to ceiling uh, racks with servers and routers uh, and storage units. And this was the technology that supported the business. Um, and right next to the racks and servers were the desks of the system administrators and technology managers who were responsible for uh, building, uh, maintaining, and protecting uh, the infrastructure and the data. And those same folks also understood where the quote-unquote crown jewels were located. The sensitive information was uh, on a specific server or a specific hard drive, and internal employees controlled the permissions to this data. Companies also had a different mindset when they thought about uh, risk. Um, the auditing, the policies to drive security were all documented and built in-house, and companies approached uh, the concept of being breached from an if perspective, not a win perspective. It was if, if, if we ever get breached, if this breach incident happens, um, we should probably think about uh, how, what we would do to respond. But there was, it was never assumed um, that a breach was definitely going to happen. Now let's talk about what we've seen change over the past few years and how we've seen this paradigm shift move from this fortress, traditional fortress model to the ecosystem model. In the last 10 or 15 years uh, or so, we've seen a dramatic shift take place to what we call the ecosystem model. If we think back to the late 90s, early 2000s, we saw a dramatic decrease in the cost of hardware, which also sparked what we call uh, the era of cloud computing. Uh, and cloud computing laid the foundation for the ecosystem model. Um, it's what allows companies to no longer operate in a fortress. So, so what happened? What took place? Uh, we saw chief operating officers, chief financial officers, looking for uh, viable, cost-effective solutions to running a data center in the basement of their facilities. Um, and when they saw the onset of uh, cloud services or SaaS type of uh, models, they embraced it because, uh, look, rather than renting the real estate and paying uh, headcount to manage um, a whole complex infrastructure, they could look to be third-party services, which offered uh, comparable service or solution uh, for a fraction of the price, uh, turnkey, with uh, little to no um, physical or headcount overhead. So it was a model that was very much embraced um, by the business side of organizations. And how did that change the way companies operated? Well, one, it empowered employees. Uh, we had the onset of BYOD, bring your own device. Uh, which means that employees were no longer tethered to a desktop and to their desk, but they could operate off of their mobile phone, off of their laptop, and really work from anywhere. A lot of the software that employees uh, began using didn't uh, no longer required a hard installation on the computer. They were SaaS applications, so employees could log in anywhere there was an internet, internet connection to the software uh, through a website. Um, we saw uh, massive decentralization of infrastructure using third-party cloud services. That means that rather than operating uh, my data center with my sensitive data in my basement, uh, the data centers are redundant and distributed all across the globe. Um, this also changed where the sensitive data was stored. Um, sensitive, sensitive data was not stored in one specific database in one specific location uh, and controlled with strict permissions. The sensitive data lives everywhere. It's in inboxes. It's on laptops. Um, it's redundantly backed up uh, in various locations. Uh, this, is, this shift has made, uh, uh, made a very difficult situation for uh, chief risk officers and chief security officers because uh, as data and operations became decentralized, so did security. Um, no longer did the CISO have uh, complete control and visibility of where uh, the sensitive data and transactional operations live because they live everywhere. Um, and that changed, uh, and it's still changing, 
how CISOs uh, approach their uh, and build their information security program. So what are some examples of an ecosystem? What does a company ecosystem look like? And why has this ecosystem model uh, significantly increased the complexity of risk management for a company? Well, think back to the Fortress model. The Fortress model is the customer, that enterprise customer, right in the center of this visualization, that yellow icon. That's the Fortress. That used to be what CISOs and chief risk officers were responsible for protecting. Now, we see companies outsourcing many of their services to third parties. And what are some examples? Um, an e-commerce company is not going to process the credit cards of their customers, one example. They're going to use a third-party credit card processor. They may use a customer service uh, uh, a support system. They may have uh, analytics tools, email marketing tools, HR uh, and finance tools, uh, research and development tools, uh, asset management services, a data warehouse and data storage services like Amazon AWS or Microsoft Azure. And those third parties behind the scenes also have third parties. The company that's processing credit cards isn't building a data center themselves. They're also using Amazon uh, to store and process the information behind the scenes uh, and so on and so forth. So it's not just third party risk. It's third party, fourth party, this party, and all of these companies are hyper-connected, sometimes across multiple layers. This is what we mean when we say an increasingly complex ecosystem of supply chain risk. This makes it very, very challenging. This is the landscape change that we talk about that's made it incredibly challenging um, for CISOs to, to take control. Why is it so challenging? Because the methods that worked for the chief security officer in the Fortress model don't apply to the ecosystem model. Specifically, what does that mean? I'll give an example. Traditionally speaking, security tests were done by simulating a hacker attack. Security practitioners would use very intrusive, invasive security testing tools and procedures uh, to try to essentially simulate a hack attack to break the system, to find the exploits in the holes before a hacker does, using the same types of techniques. Uh, and the idea is that they find them and they patch them um, before a hacker discovers. Well, that model, uh, while it works for the customer in the center, um, doesn't work for your vendors and suppliers because those aren't companies that we own or operate. And in order to run some type of invasive or intrusive hacking simulation, you need permission. Companies don't just let you run those uh, uh, without asking for permission first, because from a, from a third party uh, perspective, it looks like you're hacking them and, and they don't like that. Um, so then the challenge becomes, uh, I can get permission, but that doesn't work on a continuous basis because I can scan a company intrusively, I can simulate a hacker attack for my credit card processor, for example, and the results I received today may not be valid tomorrow. Maybe today they look secure, but tomorrow the credit card processor uh, system administrator makes a mistake and opens up some type of vulner vulnerable uh, system or vulnerable access to my data. How do I know that? The only way I, I can find that out is to perform a hacking simulation every single day continuously. Uh, and of course, my vendors don't like that. So then that, that leaves the, the CISO and the, C, the chief risk officers in this conundrum where their, their job description um, uh, outlines um, responsibilities for maintaining security protection anywhere where the data lives. The CISO is responsible for making sure that a breach incident never occurs, irrespective of where the data lives. However, that same CISO only has the control over their immediate company-owned infrastructure, anything that's operating in that third-party uh, or uh, partner ecosystem is sort of out of bounds. And then they're left asking the question, how do I protect what I can't see uh, or scan or have access to? And this is the crux of the challenge. Attacks and data loss via third-party risks are on the rise. What we know 
from documented market research is that most Fortune 1000 companies have very minimal visibility into the risk and into the vulnerabilities of their supply chain vendors. As we saw on the previous slide, increased reliance on these third-party vendors exponentially increases the overall attack surface. We also know that insufficient security awareness within organizations most oftentimes leads to human error and the mishandling of the sensitive, sensitive information that these third-party supply chain vendors are responsible for. We're now seeing more breaches originate from third-party attacks than from direct attacks on an organization. Why would a hacker try to break into a seasoned, well-protected enterprise organization when they can simply break into a small, insecure uh, third-party dependency that's storing sensitive information on their behalf? Hackers are always going to go for the path of least resistance. They're going to go for uh, the weakest link in the chain, which is oftentimes supply chain vendors. Nearly 70%, 7 out of 10 breaches are a result of poor third-party security. Many large enterprise organizations have experienced a breach incident due to one of their vendors or supply chain companies being hacked. One of the most notable incidents on this list was Target, who was hacked because their HVAC heating and cooling vendor had a direct network connection into Target's retail infrastructure to monitor the temperature of all of the Target stores. The HVAC third party uh, was hacked, and hackers used that network connection as a jumping point to gain access to Target's network and Target's customer data. A few slides back, we talked about the introduction of cloud computing and how that was the catalyst for this ecosystem of cloud computing technologies, SaaS software, uh, and uh, the beginnings of the complex supply chain ecosystem risk. We also talked about how uh, security practitioners aren't allowed to use the same intrusive scanning and hacking techniques uh, that, they test, that they use to test their own security on their vendors and partners because it's not approved. So then the next question becomes, which is the question we're going to talk about on this slide, what do they do? How do companies assess the security of a, another uh, vendor or partner that they don't own or operate but they're doing business with? And why are those techniques so cumbersome? Well, if you've ever spoken to anybody in, in vendor risk management or third-party risk management, um, they'll, they'll tell you about the pains and the struggles of their job. Since they can't use the intrusive security testing tools, they're left with using essentially pen and paper questionnaires. So for the past 20 to 30 years, uh, companies, businesses have been using uh, literally a, a spreadsheet or a, a, a pen and paper questionnaire, a Word document with, you know, 40-page Word document with um, hundreds of questions that they share with their partner request them to fill it out, and then when they receive it, they review those questions and look for responses. Now imagine trying to scale that. You have 500 vendors that your company wants to do business with every year, and you also have a filing cabinet full of thousands of businesses which you're currently working with and exchanging data with, um, and you're trying to uh, send and receive uh, pen and paper questionnaires and review the responses and then ask follow-up questions. Uh, for each one of these vendors uh, during initial assessment and annually. It's, it's, a, it's a process that's only scalable with more humans and more eyes on paper. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really work. It doesn't matter. Why? Because the information on that paper is just an opinion of another person. It's not validated with or substantiated with evidence. Sometimes companies will give audit reports or uh, penetration test results or SOC 2 reports, things like that. And those are all great. Companies should still collect that type of um, audit evidence, but that evidence is point in time. A company's security penetration test results from six months ago don't mean anything to me today. They're not applicable. So it breaks the old adage, uh, trust but verify. Companies are trusting the 
responses to the questionnaires on the paper, but there's no way for them to verify that what somebody said on the questionnaire is true. So let's look at these uh, points on the slide. We touched on some of these. Point in time snapshots that failed to address ongoing changes in security posture. What you tell me on your questionnaire answers today could change tomorrow. Same with audit evidence. No ability to validate the information or show due care to regulators. When somebody responds on a questionnaire, there's a question, let's say, do you have a firewall? Do you have antivirus? Does your antivirus software update every day? How do you validate that somebody, and, that, and somebody checks the box yes, how do you validate that they're telling the truth? You know, you and I could jump on the phone and you could ask me, uh, do you, you know, are you sure you update antivirus policies every day? And I'm going to say, yeah, of course I do. But you don't see my system. You don't see my configuration. You don't know if I have malware. You don't know what the history of uh, viruses in my network has been. Um, so it's very hard to get a, a concrete answer with evidence to uh, validate that the information on the paper is true. Um, it also makes it really hard to communicate security uh, investment and ROI to board of directors. When, you, when vendor risk management teams are trying to handle the inbound uh, requests for security reviews, like I said before, they need headcount. So they're going to their executives and they're saying, hey, I need more people to review more pieces of paper to uh, provide support for the procurement process and the security process. And executives don't understand exactly what the ROI is. Well, if I, if I give you more headcount, what does that exactly mean? How, much, how does that de-risk? Um, by how much does it de-risk? Like if I give you five headcount, um, what is the return on that investment in terms of uh, money saved or uh, risk reduction or re reduction of a, um, a breach incident occurring? Very, very difficult to quantify this information and pr to present it. Very difficult to quantify it and difficult to present it uh, to non-technical business executives. And the whole process is just labor intensive. We speak with customers who have teams of under 10 people, uh, large enterprise organizations who have teams of under 10 people doing uh, all vendor risk management for the entire company. And these folks are um, spending their days, evenings, weekends reviewing pen and paper questionnaires and then jumping on planes and going and doing on-site assessments for their tier one critical vendors. So you have folks that are essentially living in front of a computer uh, screen looking at uh, responses to uh, questionnaires and then living in planes, uh, flying back and forth doing on-site assessments. And again, all points in time, very difficult to scale. Do you remember earlier in the presentation when we talked about the vision of security scorecard? Let's bring that back one more time. The vision of the company is to instantly and non-intrusively measure the overall security risk of any company in the world. Does that make more sense now after understanding the problem and the challenges and the frustration that our customers that the, and, that, and that the market experiences? Good. Let's talk a little bit more about how Security Scorecard works. You can think about how Security Scorecard works as a three-stage process. In the first stage, our proprietary software collects as much threat intelligence information as possible using completely non-invasive, non-intrusive methods. This data goes through an automated validation and normalization process using machine learning algorithms to help us separate the signals from the noise. We then take those signals and we map them to the companies that they belong to. Then we look at a company's overall security performance, new issues versus closed issues, issue duration, and severity. And we benchmark their performance against their peers and competitors of similar size in the same industry. That benchmark is represented in the platform as an A through F letter grade, which is for the most part universally understood. The letter grade represents their overall benchmark. Underneath the letter grade, we also show performance trends, historical score, and allow companies to benchmark one vendor to another. Companies can also look at their own score and benchmark themselves against their uh, peers and competitors within their industry and understand the path to a high-performing A scorecard.
Before we dive into this slide, which is a more technical explanation of how Security Scorecard works, you should take five seconds to take a step back, blink your eyes, take a deep breath, take a sip of coffee, and then let's come back and get engaged in a more technical understanding of how Security Scorecard works. So I'm going to give you five seconds and then start presenting. Okay, good. Let's start talking through this visualization. The explanation is going to go from the bottom to the top. So we're going to start with data collection, and then we're going to end with how it gets to an overall grade. And you can think of this kind of like a hierarchy, where the data from the bottom rolls into the next layer, which rolls into the next layer, which rolls into the top. So the top is a very broad explanation of the letter grade, or broad explanation of risk as a letter grade. And then it continuously gets unpacked all the way down to data collection. So let's start from the bottom. Where do we get our data from? How do you get data on a company without doing the intrusive scanning or hacker simulation? Our data comes from a few different uh, sources. One source is data feeds. Uh, this is data that we purchase from uh, the data uh, threat intelligence feed suppliers or uh, data sharing partnerships. And this, uh, these data feeds make up about 20% of our data. The other 80% of the data come from uh, our own uh, sensors, uh, software, uh, and uh, collection algorithms that we use to crawl the entire internet um, and look for signals of risk. So let's talk about why is it an 80-20 split and what do some of these sensors and crawlers do? Um, we've invested quite heavily, uh, including um, patents behind some of the technology, in collecting our own data. Why, is, why do we put so much more value on collecting our own data ourselves with our own patented software and, tech, and algorithms and techniques versus buying data? We buy some select data from trusted data partners that we've uh, that we've built relationships with, and we've vetted. This is important to us because it really comes down to the quality of the data that you're consuming. Uh, we've seen uh, several uh, threat intelligence providers and data feed providers sell questionable data or, um, or refuse to provide transparency into their techniques and mechanisms for gathering the data. If we don't know where the data is coming from, or how they're uh, using technology to reduce false positives, how they're, uh, how they're uh, separating the signals from the noise. Um, it doesn't give us a lot of confidence. This is the, this is the, you can think of the data collection as the foundational level of everything that we do. Um, if it's a bad in, it's a bad out. So we work really hard to make sure that we have high quality, uh, high signal data um, and uh, reduction of uh, kind of false positive information. And the best way to do that is to do it yourself. Why does that matter? Because when you control the systems and software that collects the information, you can fine tune those techniques. The feedback loop uh, is much tighter uh, in terms of making improvements and we have all of our hands uh, sort of on the wheel. When you buy it from somebody else, it's very difficult to uh, make a material improvement and have a feedback loop around data quality. Um, so in a nutshell, we collect most of our own data to ensure uh, high signal quality of the data and veracity and variety of the data. We have a couple of different techniques for collecting data. Uh, we have sensors that crawl the entire internet. A sensor is just a fancy term for a piece of software that we've built. And that software sits on um, one or more servers distributed all over the world. And those sensors go out and they look for a specific type of information and they vacuum that in. It's not a specific, it's not data on a specific company, it's data on all companies. So at the first stage when we're collecting data, we collect it on every company, every IP, every host name, in the world, it's agnostic. Another technique that we use to collect data uh, is called uh, using uh, honeypots or using 
sinkholes. And these are techniques that uh, allow us to uh, listen in on the behavior uh, and the traffic of malware, botnets, spam, uh, and various types of computer infections. And by uh, basically, uh, essentially, you can think of it as pretending to be um, uh, a, a malware communication server. So we're sort of masquerading as one of these malware servers, and then an infected machine inside of an organization connects to our systems as a pass-through when communicating to the bad guy, the hacker. This allows us to listen in on what's going on, which machine's infected, how long has it been infected, what, is, what messages is the hacker sending back to the infected machine, and we can attribute this information back to the organization. So in about a, uh, throughout a month, we collect anywhere from uh, two to four plus terabytes of uh, new threat intelligence information uh, coming from, originating from these three buckets. The second stage, you can think of uh, kind of like a big data warehouse for all of the signals that we collect. So we're vacuuming in signals from all over the internet. And by the way, some of the signals are very easy to observe, but hard to scale and collect on the entire internet. Other signals are more rare and exotic and require specialized understanding and expertise in order to even find, let alone collect those signals. So we have combinations of uh, very common signals, but signals that are hard to scale, and very uh, rare, exotic, and valuable types of signals and vulnerabilities. The second stage I mentioned is, is <clears throat> kind of the, you can think of it like the umbrella or the data warehouse where all of the signals reside. And there's a few different, and we call this, uh, we call this environment threat market. So when we say threat market, you can think of threat market as uh, the location where all of the security intelligence data live. Um, and it's not just the raw signals. We do some secret sauce at this stage. We normalize the data, which means that we reduce false positives, we eliminate the noise, we ensure uh, high signal quality. And we also do something called IP attribution. Um, IP attribution takes an IP address or a host name and matches it with the company that it belongs to. This is an incredibly, incredibly valuable and important stage and technology that we've built. Why is that? Because IP attribution is an incredibly difficult task to, to master at scale. The Internet is a very uh, dynamic thing. IP address ownership or, at, or attribution changes um, sometimes multiple times per day. So how do you know who an IP address belongs to over time? To make it even more difficult, you have uh, Internet service providers, uh, data hosting providers like Amazon or Microsoft that have millions and millions of IP addresses that they lease to other companies. So how do you know if an IP address is, really belongs to Amazon or if it belongs to the company that's using Amazon AWS services? Well, we've invested a significant amount of resources, literally from day one of the company's existence, building what we call IP attribution engine. As mentioned, this is an incredibly valuable, patented, proprietary technique that we use to mend together the signals that we observe with the companies that they belong to. So within this threat market big data warehouse system, we have all of the raw threat intelligence, sanitized, clean, so it's high quality. And then we match those signals to the companies they belong to. And this is the beginning uh, of a scorecard for an organization. We then take those signals and we roll them into what we call factors. Factor is basically a layer of the security onion. When we think about information security, information security has multiple layers. You have, for example, website security, network security, endpoint security like laptops and mobile devices. You have employee security, social engineering prevention, and so forth. We've rolled up our terabytes of signals and we've uh, grouped them into these uh, 10 or 11 cohorts which we call factors. Each factor has a letter grade. 
the sum with different weights based on the criticality of the signals that we observe. The sum of these factors roll into the next level, which is the overall company grade. So when you're looking at a company's scorecard, a company will have an overall company letter grade, which is represented as an A through F, and it will also have a letter grade for each one of the risk factors. This is the first screen that security scorecard customers see when they log in. The way you can think about uh, the security scorecard interface is uh, customers create portfolios and then they add vendors into their portfolios. A portfolio is simply a grouping of companies. Uh, and then we provide some high-level analytics and metrics uh, around that portfolio to help customers understand the distribution of risk, uh, who the top performers and bottom performers are, and what the most common or systemic vulnerabilities are that exist within their portfolio. Once a user has added a company to their portfolio, they can click into that company's scorecard to view the details. This is the screen that users see once they've clicked into a specific company's scorecard. We start off by showing the overall letter grade of the company, some details about the company's industry and market size, and then we show the company's overall score performance history. Now think back to the previous status quo before security scorecard. Before security scorecard, users and our customers were using pen and paper questionnaires to try to understand how secure a company was performing. Now they have not only the ability to see the current status, but they can go back in time up to a year and see how that company's been trending over time. Has their performance increased, meaning they've taken a serious look or investment into their security performance and their security program budget? Have they decreased or have they stayed relatively consistent? Right off, of the, right off the bat on the first screen, customers can start to get a sense of uh, their vendor or supply chain partner's um, seriousness when it comes to information security and risk. Next, users have the ability to break out the overall letter grade into specific factor grades and take a look at which of the 10 discrete factors have the most issues and have the worst score. Going a layer deeper, users can click into a specific factor grade and see a detailed list of every vulnerability or positive signal security scorecard is looking for and which we've detected. Users can click into a specific issue in the list to see which IP addresses, email addresses, or digital assets have that specific vulnerability or positive signal. This allows them to identify exactly where the observation was observed, exactly what time, and also access guidance on how to analysis on both the security scores as well as the underlying data and signals that we collect. One of the exercises that they perform is an analysis to determine whether or not we can use our observations and risk indicators to, and I hesitate to use this word, predict, we'll say to tell the to predict the likelihood that a breach incident could occur. So we can't, while we can't necessarily predict the future, what we can do is say the combination of these specific events or signals or letter grades will increase the probability or likelihood that a breach incident will occur. And one of the ways that we do this is we look at companies that have been breached, we look, at, we look at companies that have not been breached, and we go back in time historically through all of the signals that we've observed, and we perform analysis on what events took place that led up to the breach incident for companies that have been breached. One of the 
observations uh, or conclusions that our data science team uh, came up with was uh, they observed that companies that had a C or lower were over five times more likely to be breached, 5.4 times more likely to be breached than a company that has an A or a B. Our customers use this information to help prioritize how much resource they invest into uh, the vendor risk management process, meaning if a company has an A or a B, our customers will perform standard risk assessment, but probably less in-depth scrutinization or resource investment than if a company has a C or lower. Companies use the letter grade as a directional indicator of where to invest their vendor risk management resources and how much resource to invest. If a company has an A or a B, our customers go through the typical motions of sending a questionnaire, asking for evidence, and doing some light scrutiny or due diligence. Beyond that, they usually fast track their vendor through the procurement and due diligence process. But if they see a company with a C, a D, or an F, they invest more of their headcount, time, and resources in vetting those companies to get a sense of comfort before they move forward. Or they may find that the company is too risky and look at a competitive solution using security scorecard, uh, looking for a company that has a better grade. And as I mentioned on a previous slide, the letter grade is a directional indicator, but the letter grade can be unpacked into those factor grades. And a factor grade can be further unpacked into the specific security issue and observation that our collection sensors and algorithms detected. So a company will start with the letter grade as a directional indicator, but can zoom in all the way to the specific IP address of the organization that they're doing business with and use that as a point of discussion in order to, give, to gain comfort. And the, the value here, the ROI is, I can, as a vendor risk manager, I can, do, I can do more assessments and have more control over my ecosystem with the same amount of resources. So what does that actually mean? Let's say I have a team of five people. Rather than applying the same amount of heavy due diligence and scrutiny to every single vendor that comes through my pipeline or every single security due diligence request that comes through my pipeline, I can better prioritize where to put heavy investment of resources and where I, need, where I can, let's say, fast track the vendor risk management process. If it's an A or a B, I'll still send out a questionnaire, I'll still ask for the evidence, but I don't need to invest in somebody flying on site to that potential vendor's uh, facility to do a visual observation of their security. I can fast track them through. But if, they have, if the same vendor has a C or a D or an F, I'm going to do more, uh, more diligence and more scrutiny. If they have an F, I may not uh, work with them. I may go back into security scorecard and start running scorecards for uh, competitive solutions and look for an alternative solution that has uh, a better grade. And that's how companies are, uh, at a high level, operationalizing security scorecard as a directional indicator. Now, for vendors and partners that are already under a contract, so it's not a request to assess a new vendor, but it's the filing cabinet full of 5,000 vendors, our customers leave those companies plugged into the security scorecard platform. And when they're left in the security scorecard platform, the, the scorecard uh, service, security scorecard, is continuously monitoring the health and security of those companies. If a company's performance dips, our customers are notified. So the status quo is, without security scorecard, our customers are doing only annual, maybe sometimes quarterly, but mostly annual assessments on those 10,000 vendors in the filing cabinet. With security scorecard, those same 10,000 vendors are continuously monitored 24-7, 365, for any change in their security posture. When a change takes place, our customers are notified, and that's, uh, that notification um, acts as a catalyst for our customer to take action. What does take action mean? Our customers reach out to the vendor and they say, let's have a conversation about your security score, and we'll talk a little bit more about that workflow on the next slide. 
built right into the security scorecard uh, application is a workflow that we call uh, the collaborative workflow for remediation. Uh, what does this mean and, and how does it work? So uh, as I mentioned on the previous slide, our customers are using scorecard to monitor uh, the thousands of vendors that they currently do business with. And when one of those vendors, uh, which is being continuously monitored, when one of those vendors drops in score, our customers are notified. What happens next? Well, what does a customer do when their vendor drops from an A to a C? Well, right within the platform, we've built a workflow that allows our customers to broach the topic of security in a productive and non-confrontational way. As you can imagine, um, you know, our customers see that one of their vendors drops in score, and then it's like a little bit of an uncomfortable conversation, right? I, I, as a vendor risk manager, I need to reach out to another company. I don't own or operate this company, but I sort of need to nudge them in the right direction and get them to fix uh, their security uh, vulnerabilities without, um, without upsetting them or kind of calling them out. Uh, so that's the intent of this collaborative workflow, is to bring both our customers and their vendors on the same page and have a productive conversation about how to improve the security score and get everybody back on track. So it starts with that first rectangle right at the top, identify the vendors at risk. Like I said, this happens either by customers logging into the platform and reviewing their portfolio, or uh, they've received an email that one of their uh, vendors or partners has uh, dipped in score. Second step is our customers right on the platform have the ability to invite uh, and share with their vendors a uh, security scorecard. Uh, they can click the invite button. The invite bu uh, button allows the customer to enter an email address uh, and share a security scorecard with their uh, contact at the, the uh, vendor company that they're working with. That vendor will receive an email uh, the, inviting them to join Security Scorecard, it will say, hey, uh, Sam from Company X has invited you uh, to log into Security Scorecard. Here's what Scorecard is, and here's why it's used. <clears throat> the vendor then gets a uh, complimentary free trial to Security Scorecard, which allows them to view uh, their own scorecard, including details for a limited period of time, currently 90 days. Uh, once the vendor has logged into the platform, our customers will see in the same platform that the status of the vendor has changed from inactive to active. So our customers get a little indicator in the platform that their vendor is logged in. Now they can go on to stage three and discuss vulnerable areas with the vendors. What exactly happens? By empowering the vendor to have access to scorecard it bridges that communication gap. Now, our customers and their vendors are looking at the exact same screen. They have the exact same information in front of them, and they can have a conversation or a dialogue around what are the issues that we've observed? Are these of concern to us? Uh, what is the remediation uh, plan to fix these issues if they are of concern? And that's the next step there. Vendor works with security scorecard and, the, and, the, and their partner to remediate. So the vendor, after they have that dialogue, they have their free trial access. They can uh, actually go into the scorecard details, look at the issues, and, uh, and they can remediate them right through our platform. They can select which issues they've fixed and click the remediation button. Uh, and that sends a notification to us to recheck for those issues. Once we've checked for those issues and confirmed and verified that they no longer exist, the vendor's scorecard is automatically updated and their score goes up. So we've taken a process that uh, in the status quo is very highly confrontational and, uh, and not always productive, and we provided both parties the tools that they need to have uh, mutual dialogue uh, along with the guidance and encouragement um, and empowerment of the vendor to proactively, uh, well, reactively improve their score, but proactively take control of their uh, scorecard. It also introduces an opportunity um, for uh, our team to um, provide more exposure to security scorecard uh, beyond customers to their filing cabinet of uh, vendors and partners that they do business with. To be clear, security scorecard is not trying to replace the questionnaire or invent 
the next best questionnaire. Questionnaires have been around for a long time and still provide some but limited value to enterprise organizations. They take a long time. They're hard to validate. They're hard to understand. Nobody really wants to fill them out, and they don't scale very well. We've supplemented the process through security scorecards. Questionnaires take a long time and have limited visibility. Security scorecard produces results that are instant, that are accurate, that are validated, and that drive accountability and improve ecosystem security. Think of security scorecard like the one-stop shop in order to prove security of any company in the world. Yes, there are uh, other security tools that scan and assess. Yes, companies still use questionnaires. All of those methods have some but limited value. But there is no other solution like security scorecard that provides the holistic, comprehensive view across all layers of the security onion, what we internally call the hacker's eye view. Security scorecard sells to various buyer personas within an organization. Let's talk about each of those personas and the high-level message that we send to each. For the chief information security officer, this is oftentimes the person that is responsible for uh, vendor risk management step of the procurement process, and that is also responsible for the security performance of their own scorecard. We message to the, the CISO uh, that they can automate the third-party and vendor security risk management process with security scorecard rather than deploying uh, tens and tens of headcount, wasting hundreds and hundreds of hours reviewing uh, questionnaires or uh, performing recurring annual uh, reassessments or audits. They can plug their vendors into the security scorecard platform, which maintains continuous non-intrusive monitoring of any of their supply chain vendors and partners. For the InfoSec or third-party risk manager, these are usually the folks who are in the weeds. Uh, they're the ones that are uh, either directing uh, the vendor risk management program, um, sending out the questionnaires and reviewing the evidence. So they're usually a hybrid of um, a security or risk policy driven individual. And the message that we send them is that they can confidently direct their third party information security program. What this means is that they can invest resources into the areas of highest risk. The companies that have the C's and D's and F's is where I allocate additional resource to go on site, to investigate, to scrutinize. Uh, the resources that, um, the companies that have an A or a B, uh, I don't need to allocate as much resource. I can fast track to keep the business uh, momentum moving and to keep the business uh, stakeholders happy. And the message that we send to board of directors, uh, board of directors oftentimes ask the CISO or security owner of a company Prove to me that you're holding our third-party vendors accountable. Prove to me that you're controlling and de-risking the third-party ecosystem. Prove to me using an independent uh, method of validation that our investment into information security budget is paying off. So the message that we send to board of directors is they can validate the efficacy of their third-party risk program and budget investment. Closing deals with security scorecard. A few closing points. Security scorecard is 100% committed to the channel. We're a 100% channel model with bi-directional value exchange. We offer 20% guaranteed margin for registered deal, 10% margin on teaming agreements, and access to an incredibly high growth market with very little saturation. We have highly engaged channel account managers as well as sales engineers dedicated sales and technical resources committed to your success, and also offer co-marketing and regeneration support. Hundreds of security leaders across all markets and all verticals trust Security Scorecard to power their ecosystem security and risk management. Our channel account managers are always available to take your questions, comments, or concerns. We have sales engineers and reps ready to participate from first meeting 
to close. With questions and comments, call Paul Acton, your channel account manager, P. Acton at securityscorecard.com, or contact him at 610-585-3084. Thank you.